Did you really? You came up with that on the fly? That's fantastic. You guys should write that down. His role in our world and our role, our role in this world. What was that? No? Anyway. Looks <laughs> <laughs> really good. I hope somebody can remember it. We're starting a new sermon series uh, for the rest of Epiphany. Epiphany means manifestation, appearing upon. It means, it means here we see God in Jesus. That's what Epiphany is, that God uh, has shown himself as clear as he can to human beings in Jesus Christ. And so this Epiphany, we're going to look at some of who Jesus is. That's, kind of, that's where we're going uh, for the next six weeks. Jesus is the Lamb of God, the light of the world, the fisher of men, the living word, the preacher of love, and the Son of God. And today, we're going to look at what it means that Jesus is the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. That's where we're going this morning. I have never, well, I can't say I don't like this, but... Lamb of God, when I first hear it, brings to my mind the, there's a lot of different ways that God tells us about salvation. He tells us about forgiveness. He tells us about adoption. He tells us about reconciliation. He tells us about restoration of harmony, shalom. All these are different ways that God tells us about the fact that he has done the work to bring us back to him because he loves us. And the, the word Lamb of God, I have to tell you, brings to my mind, at first blush, the, the, I, the way of salvation, the, the picture that God paints for us, that least resonates with my soul. In fact, I kind of almost have a problem with it. I'm just being very upfront with you. There are some things that you kind of don't hear as easily as others, and this is one of mine. We, in fact, we sang it in the last, in the, in the um, where is it? Uh, in the, in the um, one of the verses in Christ alone, it said, the wrath of God was satisfied. The wrath of God was satisfied. And I will tell you that I, that's a hard one for me to hear as a father. Because if the Bible says God is our father, I, I definitely can hear that, that, you know, sin has to be paid for kind of and all that stuff. But for me to have an anger that has to be satisfied, that's kind of... I just can't imagine that I would withhold, you know, I would separate my children from me until my anger is appeased. And so that's a hard one for me. And, and so this week was actually very good for me, I will tell you, because I dug into what it means to be the Lamb of God. And I'm, I'm afflicted with this particular disease or curse in that I really can't stand not understanding things. I can't stand it. And it's getting worse rather than better because, as most of you know, we now cannot account for over 90% of the mass and energy of the universe. We just don't know what it is and we can't observe it. So the more we know, the more we don't know how much, the more we know how much we don't know. Which, for someone who is afflicted with the curse of wanting to know and understand, is a very hard spot to be. My, uh, and these things burn in my mind. My neighbor, get the, uh, I live in, uh, near Vista Lakes, where the bombing range was, right? You remember the, the bombing track, that whole thing and stuff? There's actually a class action lawsuit. One day, my neighbor came out, and there was a little hole drilled in his driveway. And there was a little pl plastic plug in it. Now, he didn't drill the hole. He never, get, never gave anybody permission to drill the hole. He has no idea how the hole got here. Nobody observed anything, and yet there is the hole. You can guess that that is just killing me. <laughs> and I'm stuck with that forever. That hole is that's burning in my mind, and I don't know what to do with it. And so we have this Lamb of God thing, and, and uh, immediately the first thing, of course, that comes to my mind is the Passover lamb, right? The slaughtered lamb. Well, I went and looked into that. By the way, the dig deeper material, uh, digs deeper into this lamb thing. We're only going to just do it lightly. We're going to skim it here for a couple minutes. It turns out that the lamb, the Passover lamb, which, by the way, on careful reading, could be a sheep or a goat. Just has to be a young sheep or goat. Uh, a, a 
blemish, that kind of thing. It turns out, if it, on close reading also, that that doesn't have anything to do with sin. John calls uh, Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so the Passover Lamb doesn't actually do anything for sin. It's, it, if you will remember that they killed the lamb and they had, basically they had to eat the whole thing. And if there were, if there wasn't, a, if, it's very clear, if the family wasn't big enough to eat the whole lamb in one night, they should get multiple families together. And if there's anything left, they should burn it. There should be nothing left in the morning. But that's just uh, extra stuff for you. Um, they, they would uh, kill the lamb and cook and eat it and smear the blood of the lamb, or the young lamb, or the goat on the doorpost of their house. And when that would be the mark that they were children of Israel, and when uh, God came through to slay the firstborn of the Egyptians as the final stroke that would let Pharaoh finally free the Egyptians from their slavery, uh, their house would be passed over. And so the Passover lamb actually doesn't have anything to do with taking away sin. So now we have the, the, the lamb, if we move forward, we've got some other lamb imagery we go to Isaiah 53, which is a, a piece of, of scripture that's read during Lent a lot, Lent and Good Friday. Uh, um, uh, Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, but we esteem him strict, uh, esteemed him not. He was strict. He, do you know? Somebody say, oh, oh, you guys all know this. We esteemed him stricken, stricken by God and afflicted, right? And then it says, like a lamb, I've got it written. I should read these instead of thinking about it. Here we go. It's in your bulletin. It's one of the verses. It's one of the daily Bible verses. Uh, sh -sh -sh. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So again, the sheep comparison doesn't have to do with taking away sin. So what does this lamb do? What, what does it mean to be the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? Well, it turns out there's one more thing. This word lamb is also used for a dear child. Many of you have sung the hymn, I am Jesus, little lamb. That's right. And, and so the question we're left with that we try to dig deeper out of the dig deeper stuff is, what does it mean that Jesus is the lamb of God? What, what is lamb actually trying to say to us? And I, th and I think it's, if we try to pick one, we're doing the wrong thing. Because I think it's kind of wrapping all those things into it. He's got the attitude of a lamb, right? He, he, he lets the thing happen to him. He's, he uh, dies like the Passover lamb that uh, keeps us uh, from the judgment of God that he's pouring out on Israel. And if we move forward into Revelations, we see the lamb of God uh, as the one who gets to open the scrolls, the, these uh, scrolls of the end of the world and things. Uh, he's the one who's worthy, and he's pictured as a lamb who was slain. <clears throat> so the truth is, I don't know that we're ever going to get definitively at what John was meaning when he said Jesus is the lamb of God. But what John tells us is that the one who told him to go baptize told him who to look for, who would be the Lamb of God. And so we want to embrace that. We want to embrace the Lamb of God, even though it's got this sort of variety, this kind of smear of meanings around it. And you know, that drives me crazy. <laughs> because it doesn't have one single meaning that I can just probe and feel confident in. But the good thing is, the good thing is that that is not actually <clears throat> the operative or most important part of this verse. The most important part of this verse is this. Who takes away the sin of the world. Right? Sin, uh, some of you will recall, is actually an archery term. It is, means missing the mark. And it's something the Bible says we all do. We all are. We are not as God would have us be. We are not perfect. We confess it at the beginning of every service because it's God's way of of bringing us peace, the truth of our imperfection, and then the wonder of this forgiving, gathering love that God gives us. And so takes away the sin is actually the big deal here. It, we call him Lamb of God, and so he is.
what takes away the sin, frankly, is the part I want to keep. I don't care if John said, behold, the broccoli of God. As long as he said, who takes away the sin of the world, right? I mean, you can use whatever picture you want for Jesus, as long as that reconciliation remains, right? As long as the separation from God is brought back together. That's the thing that we want to keep. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I think the world there is also very important because it is an all-encompassing term. Sometimes you might wonder if God is really forgiven. Sometimes you might wonder if God loves you. Are you on the inside or the outside of this Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and this death of Christ that, that uh, reconciles us to God and brings his forgiveness? And the answer is right there. Who takes away the sin of all the people seated on this half of the <laughs> Sorry. No, it doesn't. It's an all-inclusive term. Takes away the sin of the world. The Bible says that in Jesus, and, and John the Baptist proclaimed this, that the death of Jesus has dealt with everything. Has dealt with everything. And some of you need to hear that today. Some of you have a couple things that burn in your mind, like that hole in the driveway, of my, like my neighbor's driveway, the hole in my neighbor's driveway. You have like some things that burn in your mind and you just back there you wonder because that was boy I don't know God what you need to hear today is of the world because and, and because that, it's it's general the world is a general term but it's made up of individual people so sometimes we almost don't hear ourselves in it because it's such a general term but it is a general term because it encompasses everybody so, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we're going to go, we're going to, uh, we're going to see some other things as we look at different titles of Jesus later on. But this is the big deal for us today. He is the one who takes away the sin. He is the one who begins the restoration. The world is broken. The world does not act like it should. People don't act like they should. And the Bible says Jesus is the one who makes it all better. Jesus, the, we have this natural wanting to make a list of wrong and right, to keep track of good and bad, of things that need forgiven. And the Bible says that Jesus has dealt with all of that as the Lamb. And that is why, that is why he is the one we glorify. Because he's the one who did the work of bringing us back to God. Revelation 5.13 is the verse for next Thursday. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Because he's powerful? Well, he is powerful, but that's not the reason. Because he's the one through whom God created the world? Well, he is, but that's not the reason. To him be glory and honor and power and might forever, because he is the one who willingly died in our place. Like a lamb before its shearers is silent. He did not make a sound. Oh, as he lived, Jesus, that, now that's not, that's not to say he went around like a mush ball. Anybody who's read the life of Jesus knows exactly the opposite. He was not afraid to be right in people's face, to call things as he see him, to speak the truth, to power, all those things. But when the time came for him to die, when the time came for him to do the work he said he came to do, he was silent. In fact, he was so silent that it freaked out the people who were judging him. They said, aren't you going to say anything? Pilate said, aren't you going to say anything at all? Don't you know I have the power to set you free or have you crucified? And you know what Jesus said? All he said was, you would have no power over me if it wasn't given to you from the Father. He was silent. He just did what he had to do. And I think that, I, I think in those terms, uh, 
Jesus' work in our world gives us a picture of our work in this world. Thank you again. God bless 2014. <laughs> because he did what he needed to do to reconcile the world to God. And he did it without complaining. He walked through. He didn't, ex he didn't expect anything. He was silent before those who were accusing him. And he did what he needed to do. And I think you and I can hear that and see that picture today and say, that's the call on our lives, is to be like that lamb. To, to, not, to not want glory for doing what we're doing. We just silently do what needs to be done. We silently and, and peacefully, without, de de without desire and recognition, seek reconciliation in our relationships. We silently and without, without a need for fanfare reach out to those who are lost and are hurting. We silently and without need for fanfare go after the unloved to show them love. We do the work in our world, in this world, that Jesus has done in our world as the Lamb of God. We continue his work to bring reconciliation and love and peace to other people. Revelation 7, 17 is the verse for next Saturday, and it says this. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. The Lamb becomes the shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And then this is where I want to end, because this is the goal of the Lamb. This is the goal of Christ coming to earth. This is what the end game is. And it's an end game we participate in, in little ways, here and there, as God puts opportunities for ministry in our lives. This is the end game. Revelation 7, verse 17. He will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That that is fantastic. Some of you are going through things right now that are tears. I know. And the Bible says that Jesus came so that we know that all those things are temporary. And one day, all these teary things will be done. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And joy will be ours. Joy will be ours. <clears throat> Knowing that, Knowing that that has been given to us by Jesus as a free gift by the Lamb of God is what enables us and gives us strength to be Christ's ambassadors in the world, to do his, the work of love he's done in us, to do that work in this world, to act as lambs among wolves. Jesus said that. He said he's sending his disciples out like sheep among wolves. And so are we. If we are committed to be followers of Jesus Christ, if we are committed to live the life Christ lived, the li if we are committed to live the life that God has given us as Jesus would live it instead of as we would live it, we too are lambs among wolves. But what the Bible tells us is the land is victorious. And we will be victorious. It will not be without trouble or strife or pain difficult, but we will be victorious as we follow the Lord's We will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, <clears throat> this picture you've given to us of Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, we could barely scratch the surface of, of, of all that is wrapped up in that sentence, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But in it, we do see, we see the Passover Lamb, whose blood marks your people so they were not subject to the judgment of the Egyptians, and they were passed over. We see the image of the, of the Lamb who uh, went forward to do what needed to be done silently and willingly. Father, as we live our lives, help us first see ourselves as lambs of the lamb who has become the good shepherd. 
help us to see ourselves as his dear little lambs, his dear children. And as his children, help us walk in his shoes and follow in his footsteps. Help us to uh, be people who are those who are willing to absorb pain and loss and sacrifice for the love of others. Help us to be your people of love and to just do it silently and without fanfare. Like a sheep getting sheared. Make us into people of love and help us follow your lamb who took away the sins of the world so that he might wipe away every tear from our eyes. Continue as we collect the prayer cards and the offer.